deep within Jupiter's atmosphere. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So to understand how the belts and zones change with depth, we needed to exploit microwave light. These clouds are completely transparent in the microwave, and that allows us to peer deeper than ever before. And when we peered through this veil, we got a surprise. Now, ammonia depletion in the belts should make them shine brightly in microwave light. And that's, that's certainly what they do in all the channels that sense shallow pressures. And those are the three slices that you see on the left of this animation. But the plot thickens as we start to move deeper below the expected uh, cloud layers into the warmer, deeper atmosphere, as we do for the three microwave channels on the right. Now, sunlight doesn't get down this far, so we're truly probing new depths here. And we see that the belts that were shining brightly in the shallow atmosphere have become microwave dark, whereas the zones become microwave bright. And all this is the complete opposite of what we saw at the cloud tops. And you can see this for yourself. If you follow one of those blue arrows from left to right across Jupiter, the bright bands become dark. The edges of the bands remain the same as those we see at the cloud tops, revealing that these belts and zones do go hundreds of miles deep but that their character reverses as we go deeper. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we call this transition layer the Jovicline, and it appears to be located near the layer where the temperatures in the atmosphere are just right for water clouds to form, about 40 miles or 65 kilometers down below the visible clouds. Now, a cline is a layer within a fluid where properties change, and sometimes these serve to separate one domain from another. Give you an example, the Earth's oceans have a thermocline, which divides mixed surface waters from cold and deep waters below. Now, for Jupiter, this isn't a new idea. The legendary science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke envisaged the voyage of the Contiki balloon down into Jupiter's atmosphere in his 1971 short story, A Meeting with Medusa. He describes the balloon traveling down towards a Jovian thermocline and its associated bank of clouds. And we're playfully adopting that term here as well. In our case, the Jovicline appears to separate Jupiter's shallow weather layers with microwave bright ammonia depleted belts from deeper layers of microwave dark ammonia enriched belts that are down below the water cloud layer. More simply, the Jovicline may separate the cloud forming weather layer that we all know and love from the deeper abyss that lies below. Now, this unexpected result implies something is moving all of that ammonia around. Maybe it's the circulation cells that were just described by Karen, or possibly some other meteorological phenomenon at work within this deep atmosphere. What's clear is that the microwave light has really opened a new window onto Jupiter's dark, warm, and deep atmosphere, and that the results are really going to be challenging our understanding of this giant planet for years to come. Now, this is the story at the middle latitudes on Jupiter, at least. And now I'm going to hand over to Alessandra, who's going to describe what's happening higher up in the polar domain. Thank you, Lee, and greetings from Rome. So as you mentioned, we have an infrared camera on board Juno. And an infrared camera is a very powerful instrument because infrared is the light which is emitted from a body, while visible light is just reflected. So there is much more information in uh, the infrared uh, radiation. For example, they can tell the temperature of your body just by pointing uh, an infrared uh, thermometer to you. The other advantage is that uh, in the infrared, just like in a spy movie, you can see your enemies in the dark if you were some kind of infrared uh, imager. And this is very useful on a planetary mission because in this way, you can, for example, observe the dark side of a planet or regions where the illumination is very poor, such as the poles of Jupiter. Because in fact, thanks to this camera, which is called JIRAM, and thanks also to other, the other camera on board Juno, which is called JunoCam, Juno discovered a very peculiar, I would say unique structure on Jupiter, on the poles of Jupiter, symmetric structures. Now, symmetry is really beautiful in science because every time you see something symmetric, uh, you think that there should be something hidden below that is driving uh, this symmetry, some kind of force, some kind of a hidden mechanism or law, which you want to discover. And so I would like to get to the first slide. So right after its arrival five years ago, Juno discovered that there are regular polygons with cyclones at the corners, and those are at the poles of Jupiter. At the south, which is what you're seeing now, we have a pentagon with uh, five cyclones at the corners and a sixth cyclone in the center. 
And in the north, which is not shown here, we have an octagon with an octagon center. Each one, by the way, is larger than Texas, and the velocity are of the order of uh, 200 miles per hour. And we were puzzled because, of course, we will uh, we asked ourselves, how is it possible we will be able to observe them until the end of the Juno mission? And the result I'm presenting right now is that yes, they are exceptionally stable, so they are we are still observing them. So after October 2021, the Pentamon, for example, is still there almost unperturbed, is just rotated a little bit, 15 degrees. Now, at the Earth, we know that cyclones are very fast and they have a very short lifetime. How is it possible that at Jupiter they are so different? We think that it is because of the peculiarity of Jupiter. And I ask the next slide, thank you. So just like at the Earth, uh, cyclones or hurricanes are pushed poleward following a force that is called the beta drift. And this force is indicated by the blue arrow. This force is due to the rotation of the planet. So the first cyclone that gets to the pole, it occupies the pole, and the next, one, the next ones are forced to stay at some equilibrium distance because the first cyclone has a rejection force, which is indicated by the green arrows. They keep them at a distance. Also, they interchange mutual forces so they want to stay at equal distances, and those forces are indicated by the magenta arrow. So the, this way we explain the stability and the regularity, the symmetry of the cyclones. Next slide, please. So in fact, a, a study has been published recently to explain such stability and the number of cyclones. And the most important thing to me, this study is also able to explain the reason why we do have this kind of structure at Jupiter and we don't have them at Saturn. Because at Jupiter, we have just the right side of the planet, the right uh, momentum, the right uh, wind speed to achieve this kind of stability. And at Saturn, we don't have that. Final slide, please. There is another a last consequence of this, as cyclones they talk each other. Because Juno observed that if one cyclone is perturbed from its motion, uh, then this perturbation is transmitted to the other cyclone because of this kind of elastic forces. You can think there are springs in between that uh, uh, helps cyclones to communicate each other. And uh, after one year, this perturbation has gone from one side to the other. And this gets back to my initial question, and I have, I'm done with this slide. So we will, will we be able to observe them until the end of Juno mission? Uh, how long will they stay uh, this way? Of course, we don't know, nobody knows. But chances are that uh, not only Juno mission, but also the Jewish mission uh, in the next decade will be able to observe uh, such features because maybe they are uh, very stable. Their lifetime can, can last uh, hundreds of years, just like the red, red red spot. And because I mentioned the red red spot, it, it's time to get back to Scott. Thank you, Alessandro. That was great. It's really exciting. The polar cyclones have, have been intriguing to me since we first discovered them. And of course, we can't see them from the Earth because we're looking, you know, from the equatorial plane and these things are only at the poles. And so uh, it really took something high up in latitude to be able to see it like uh, like Juno. And what we've seen here today uh, is is sort of a new understanding of, of Jupiter's atmosphere and how it works. Um, and this all comes from Jupiter's, uh, Juno's technique of being able to see inside the polar orbit and also our ability to look in light that really isn't, that our eyes aren't capable of seeing like uh, infrared or the microwave vision that the microwave radiometers see, um, you know, where we can see inside. So it's very important in science to be able to look at and extend the human eye into other wavelengths. And the, this new understanding ha, uh, applies uh, equally to the individual vortices, like the Great Red Spot, as well as the uh, the zones and belts. Although there's really big differences, we see the the vortices going down hundreds of miles, and um, and we see the zones and belts maybe going down thousands. Um, and mean you know maybe the breaks on those wind stream uh, jet streams aren't really applied until uh, they run into you know the magnetic field of Jupiter, which is deeper down. Um, but it's just amazing to see how this evolution works and the similarities a, a little bit between the zones and belts and these vortices is that the water clouds are playing a role. It's where these inversions start to happen. Something's special about water at Jupiter, just like sunlight, just like Earth. But 
these roots go right past it. And so uh, somehow you have to be transporting ammonia and water and things deeper down after it's an all after they're all gas, right? There's it's so warm in Jupiter down below there that it's that stays vapor, yet they don't really mix up together. Um, we've seen that the circulation cells exist. Um, we've now got evidence of that. They're very similar to Earth, but of course there's many more of them because Jupiter is a monster planet. Um, the the Jovicline, which with Arthur Arthur C. Clarke uh, almost envisioned in this idea, and and we see this inversion in the zones and belts uh, with this with this uh, Jovicline almost a little bit like uh, Earth's oceans, and then finally the polar cyclones that Alessandro just talked about, and we wondered since we discovered these how stable they are. Um, what forms them, and, and we've finally got some progress and made some understanding of, of answers to some of those questions. Uh, another big question is how deep are the roots to these giant polar cyclones? And we hope to be able to, to actually determine that in the extended mission um, because we'll be getting closer and closer to the North Pole uh, in the extended mission, and eventually the microwave vision will tell us how deep the roots are to these. Um, now I'd like to just spend a little bit of time showing you some of the most uh, fascinating new pictures that just came down in the last week from our last flyby uh, of Jupiter. Um, next slide, please. So this image we call Bands of Color. Uh, it's made by a citizen scientist, Brian Swift. All of our, our data from JunoCam, this is a JunoCam image, is loaded onto a website, the Mission Juno website, and amateurs, citizen scientists, even professionals, uh, and people from all walks of life, school children, go in and make these pictures and post them. And Brian is, uh, Swift is particularly talented at it. Um, you can see in this image, it's a very different perspective. The, the zones and belts that we've been talking about are just wisps on the horizon at the edge of, these, of this image because you're looking at a very unique perspective. Um, and then you see these two vortices, one in the forefront that's very large, and you can see these little pop-up clouds in there and the grays and whites. And then in the distant on the far uh, left, you see uh, a hint of another kind of uh, cyclone that's reddish. And this is giving us this new unique perspective. It's a very good example of how the storms uh, are different on, on Jupiter. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's another one also by Brian Swift, um, and these are called swirling storms. And so now you're seeing sort of a, a little bit of the smorgasbord that, that Jupiter throws at us. You have both the, the vortice, vortex type storms that are, are a little bit roundish, and then you have these wispy swirling winds. This is in the north, north temperate belt, so it's in the northern latitudes. Um, and you can see, again, these pop-up clouds, these little white clouds. There's almost shadows that are visible there, so you can see that those are resting above another cloud base. Um, these things are where we think there's updrafts of ammonia, and they get it gets up such a high altitude that you eventually form ammonia ice clouds. And um, although they look tiny in this picture, Jupiter's immense. And so these, these little tiny clouds are still 25 to 50 kilometers across. So these are actually quite big by themselves, um, not nearly as big as, of course, the Great Red Spot. Um, and then finally, another picture of, the, of Jupiter's uh, storms is something that's just sort of clouds being stacked up on our north equatorial belt. Again, Brian Swift uh, created a great image here, and it really shows um, and a, a great example of how the images from Juno can, can look in and see different layers. Um, so you can see the, the different cloud decks, even without the microwave vision, um, you can see that you're seeing a 3D effect here where um, the, the light uh, tan and gray clouds are sitting above a pool of darker gray, um, and there's orange storms that are peeking out from underneath the dark. And so you can see shadows actually being layered on this so you can tell the different altitudes. And again, at the very top are those pop-up clouds. And, uh, and so these filamentary swirls are some of the most beautiful, um, almost Van Gogh-like uh, like, uh, artistry that Jupiter is exhibiting. Um, next uh, slide is a sort of a teaser, um, and that is, this is Europa, actually. Uh, we just got this on the last orbit. It's, it's taken at a distance of about 80,000 kilometers, so we're pretty far away. The resolution is still about 50 or 60 kilometers per pixel, so it's not the best resolution that NASA's ever obtained of Europa, 
but it was put together uh, very craftily and very well by a citizen scientist named Andrea Luck. And, and this picture um, shows the albedo differences, the color differences that, that we see at Europa even close up. You can see the almost continent-like things. Of course, this is an ice shell. And what's also unique that, that we're really uh, have an advantage of, that Juno has an advantage of, is, is that we're seeing uh, a new region that we haven't seen before. The center of this image is really the North Polar region, and we haven't been able to see that. And so we look forward to uh, next year about this time, we'll be by, flying by really close, just a, a few hundred kilometers above Europa's surface, and we'll get very high resolution images. But this one already is a, is a tantalizing example and uh, a taste of what's to come. And so with that, I thank you very much for allowing us to share our excitement and for your role in helping to share that excitement with the public. I turn it back to Raquel. Great. Thank you, Scott. We'll now move into the Q&A portion. And remember, if you're a member of the media on the phone line, you can press star one to get into the queue to ask your question. And if you're on social media, you can ask questions using the hashtag JunoMission. Now, the first question comes from social media. We have Kevin on Facebook who asks, how fast is the atmosphere moving? Are they clouds or more like vapor? So uh, I'll just give you a very quick answer that they're, 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 what you're seeing are clouds when you look at the visible images are mostly clouds, but you're seeing different layers. And so there is, uh, but everything's, they're not all vapor. The clouds of course can be, uh, have liquid, because uh, you've got condensation of water, you've got condensation of ammonia, you've got a couple different molecules in there that can create different layers of clouds, different colors, um, and they're swirling around. Now, when you say how fast are they moving, that's kind of a loaded question because the zones of belts are blowing in different directions um, and, so, and at different speeds. And so it depends on where you look, how fast they're blowing. Um, Jupiter itself spins around, even though it's enormous, spins around in 10 hours. So here it is 10 or 11 times bigger than Earth, and it's spinning around two and a half times faster. Um, for a little bit more specifics on exactly how fast the winds, I'd like to turn to Lee and let him talk about the zone and belt wind structure. Sure, thanks, Scott. So it's a uh kind of hard to get your head around some of the speeds that are involved in the motions of uh, cloud features across Jupiter. But around the equator, we can actually look and observe with a telescope over just a few hours. And you can see those clouds zipping along from west to east or east to west at hundreds of miles per hour. Now that's in the sort of horizontal uh, plane. If you're talking about motions that might be going upwards or going downwards, they're much slower. You only have to have motions that are on the order of centimeters per hour in order to get these things uh, um, uh, moving up and down the ammonia cells as we're, we're talking about. Great, thanks for your answers. We have someone on the call line now. It's Elizabeth Howell from space.com. Hi, thanks for taking my question. This one's probably for Alessandro. So I was reading your paper and I understand from that, as well as your discussion, why the oscillations around the poles appear to be very stable in terms of those cyclones. But you know that you did see a new cyclone form temporarily in 2019. So can you explain how that happened within the context of all the stability? Basically, the, the five cyclones are probably uh, a, a configuration where they leave some kind of free space for an intruder to, to get in. But this intrusion may occur only sometimes because the configuration probably is stable at five, maybe not so stable at six, or maybe you need a, a very huge cyclones to get the sixth place. So either the five configuration is stable and six is not, so that if a six cyclones get in, it is rejected, or maybe you need a very big cyclones to get the sixth place and get a new conf stable configuration with six cyclones, like an hexagon that we don't know still because we need more observations and more events like this to, to develop a consistent theory for this. Thank you. And up next to on our call line is Marcia Dunn from the AP. Yes, hi. Um, question, I believe, for Dr. Bolton. Um, I'm wondering how many individual storms would you estimate that there are at Jupiter? 
And would you consider, from what you've been able to analyze so far, that the Great Red Spot is the deepest or one of the deepest um, is regarding its roots? And you mentioned that you cannot see the bottom of the Great Red Spot, so I'm wondering how much deeper could it conceivably go? Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll take the questions in reverse order because I'm not sure I'll be able to answer the very first one. <laughs> how many storms are there? Um, but the great red spot, we with the microwave eyes, right, the way we see through the clouds, um, we detected it in our deepest channel, which was a couple hundred miles down. Uh, now, Marzia looked at the gravity field, and they're looking at, you know, the concentration of mass that might be associated with that great red spot and looking at very sensitive measurements of the gravity field and the distortions of, of the spacecraft's path. Um, as she explained, and that put a lower limit on it that said that at least the bulk of the mass that's associated with that storm is sitting in the first 500 kilometers uh, below the cloud tops. And so we think we've bound the problem between the microwave. It's deeper than 200 miles, but probably not deeper than, say, 300. Now, that doesn't mean there's a hard root cutoff. I, I, you know, I think it probably fades out gradually and keeps going down, but the bulk of the mass is is sitting in above about 300 miles probably maybe and there's there's some error bar on that maybe it's 350 miles it, you know we we're not sure exactly but it's still way below the water cloud now whether that's the deepest storm um it's the it's probably the deepest one that we've seen i mean the there was another uh, vortex the one i showed first that i called the barge that we see also in the deepest channel, but the signal's not as uh, robust. And so we believe it was already starting to fade out. Whereas in the great red spot, it was still really strong. And so uh, we think of the three, one, three vortex storms that we looked at that the great red spot was the deepest. Now, whether that means it's the deepest in any uh, in all over Jupiter, I'm not sure. And a, another candidate might be the polar cyclones. I mean, well, it'll be very interesting to see when we get to the top of the planet later in the extended mission, how deep those go. Um, I wouldn't want to be too quick to guess um, that we've seen the deepest, but the great red spot is the largest and that makes it special by itself. And, and you might expect that it might be deeper um, just because of that. But I think it's, it's a, too, a little bit too early to guess that. Now, the last question, and I'm going to open this up to, to Lee in a minute too, which is how many storms are on Jupiter at any given time? Um, I have, uh, you know, I would say it's covered. I mean, if, if you know, if you look at the high resolution images of, of from JunoCam, um, the place is covered with just incredibly beautiful swirls, um, vortex storms that are round. Some of them are these filaments just blowing around. All those are stormy places. And when you look at all of them, you see pop-up clouds, you see up-down drafts. I mean, the zones and belts are, are driving things. The water clouds are driving things. The sunlight, I mean, I, I hate to put a number on it, but it wouldn't surprise me if, you, if, if Jupiter didn't have thousands uh, across its body. Um, and, you know, if you were living on Jupiter, it would be a, a real difficult task trying to do a weather report. But Lee, maybe you can shed some light from your insights. Yeah, I think you're on the right tracks there, there Scott. I mean, when there, there are two pieces of information that might uh, might help think about how stormy Jupiter is. The first is that even from Earth, from a backyard telescope, you can see a whole smorgasbord of activity in the Jovian atmosphere. And talented amateur astronomers are able to track those individual features as they're moving around in order to reconstruct things like the wind field. And they're tracking hundreds of these tiny spots every single night. That's quite incredible. And the second piece of information actually comes back to the Juno mission itself. And that is the number of lightning strikes we're able to see covering the entire planet and actually getting more prevalent as we get up to high latitudes. And those lightning strikes are presumably associated with the separation of charge within thunderclouds, cumulonimbus clouds like we're familiar with on Earth. And they are happening all of the time. This world really is an enormous maelstrom of storm activity. And just like Scott, I'd hesitate to put a precise number of it on it for you, but thousands is in the right ballpark. 
Thank you for your responses. Uh, up next on our phone lines, we also have Bill Harwood from CBS News. Um, yeah, hi. Thanks very much. Um, I guess this is for Scott. Uh, two questions. Um, as someone who enjoys looking at the Great Red Spot with his telescope, whatever he can, is there anything in the data so far that, that even hints uh, at how it's managed to be stable for so long? Is there, are there any guesses as to as to that and, and, and why it seems to be shrinking over the past few decades? And then and also, uh, speaking of the polar vortexes, um, how does the, what's going on at Jupiter, how do we think that compares to what we see in the polar regions of Saturn, which is pretty bizarre, too? Thanks. Yeah, those are all really good questions, Bill. Um, so, you know, when we look at the Great Red Spot, uh, of course, we've been observing it for decades with with telescopes and NASA missions and Hubble, um, you know, and then before that you had, you know, even old telescopes that, that uh, you know, almost antique type, type things that were discovering it. And what Juno is able to do is, is we, 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 we sense that it's, it seems to be shrinking um, and appears to be shrinking since say even the days of Voyager, right? And, and what we're doing is seeing up close what's happening while that shrinking is, is going on. And we see sometimes flecks of these red flecks of, uh, I don't want to call them paint, but they're clouds or things that are getting caught up in that. that and so the dynamics are, are sort of being studied and we can see things are changing. I don't think the theory is very far advanced to the sense where we can connect all of that to the changes in the size, except that we're starting to see that there are elements of the dynamics uh, that are telling us that. And the depth of the root may be a, 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 a hint as to its longevity as well. Um, you might think that something with the really deep root might be able to last longer. Um, but keep in mind that, you know, from, from the image that Marzia showed us, you know, when I lift the great red spot out, it still kind of looks like a pancake. The pancake's thicker than we might have expected, but this is not a, uh, a, a storm that goes down into the middle of Jupiter at least not that we've seen. Uh, and, and certainly the gravity field data doesn't suggest that, but it is have a deeper root maybe than the other vortices and that may be part of its longevity. Um, it's also trapped, you know, sort of between these two conveyor belts. Uh, a lot of the vortices are sort of built that way. You've got the zones and belts moving back and forth in different directions. They're almost like conveyor belts of winds and, and, they're, and things can get sort of stabilized in between them, right? and like a ball bearing almost spinning around. And, and so I think all of those are kind of hints um, on the longevity. I'm trying to remember, did you have another follow-up question to one of those? Because you've stacked a few and I might've forgot one. You know, if Bill had a follow-up question, we can have him get back in the queue and he can ask it again, because we do have another caller on the line, and then we'll just get back to you, Bill, when you get on the line. Up next is Rick Lovett from Freelance. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, technical. I think I know the answer, but I want to be sure of it. Um, the How were the rotations, the circulations of the north-south belt uh, determined? Um, is is that Doppler on ammonia in microwaves? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following the question. It's it's how how do we determine the the motion of the zones and belts, the directions? Um, um, so we're not really doing that on Juno, although we can get images that are spaced apart and measure some winds. But I'm going to let Lee take a crack at that. If I interpreted the question right, you probably will be able to best answer it. Rick sounds like he has a well, Actually, I think maybe I'm not thing. the right person to, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that one. Maybe if uh, if you don't mind, Karen, I might come across to you. We were talking about how the motions of the zones and belts were measured from an ammonia perspective. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Rick, for asking that. Actually, um, <clears throat> what the, Lee showed is the microwave data, and uh, we were able to interpolate this data as the uh, movement of ammonia. 
So in fact, we find that uh, in the poleward side of the eastward jets, uh, we find a peak in ammonia. That means that ammonia is being carried from below towards the surface, the cloud deck. And on the equatorward side of the jets, of the eastward jets, ammonia is being carried down uh, by these vertical velocities. And then we were able to model those vertical velocities uh, with the uh, measurements from Cassini of the turbulence in the atmosphere. And we were able to recreate uh, the data using a model describing these circulation cells. So uh, we, were, we aren't able to measure them using Doppler shift. I think that was uh, your question, uh, but we are able to um, uh, we are able to model the, those velocities using uh, the microwave data, uh, which is uh, quite an astonishing uh, tool that we have here on Juno. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Let, let me just add something, because now I understand the question. I did mis misinterpret it. And what you were talking about was the vertical motions. And I, for some reason, thought you were talking about the sideways motions. So it isn't done with Doppler at all. The, the microwave radiometer is, is, is a radiometer, which is broadband and doesn't have the spectral type information that tells us um, exactly the lines where you could measure a particular emission line and measure its Doppler. Um, and so it's done the way Karen uh, was was discussing. There's there's the the Doppler measurements are are only in the gravity field. Rick, I hope that answered your questions for you. Up next on our phone line is Marcia Smith from Space Policy Online. Thanks so much for taking my question, and I apologize if I missed this earlier or in the press release, but. Uh, Scott, could you talk about the health of the spacecraft? And I thought I heard you mention something about an extended mission. How much longer do you anticipate getting this kind of data? And could you also talk more about the citizen science component of this? It looks like you're getting an awful lot of uh, good data out of that. And uh, how do people learn about it and get to participate? Uh, sure. This, that's, those are great questions. Um, so the extended mission um, just, just started this summer, uh, uh, technically August 1st, um, and uh, we had completed the number of orbits that were in our primary mission. And uh, the health of the spacecraft is excellent. Um, you know, Jupiter is, is a, um, a very dangerous place um, with a lot of radiation, um, and, and we were protected like a, like a tank with a lot of armor. And, um, and at, at the moment, the, the, the shields are holding up. If I can borrow something from Star Trek, the shields are holding. And we're not seeing uh, r any real indication of degradation, which is great. And that really is uh, uh, a marvel and, and attributed to the great engineering that JPL and Lockheed Martin were able to put together um, and, uh, and make sure that we could last. And so um, the extended mission is approved all the way through, um, I think, September of 2025. Um, and that uh, is about uh, a, a bit more than 40 more orbits. And that's a lot. Um, we will take a lot of radiation by the end of that. So I don't, you know, we're going to keep our fingers crossed uh, that we last throughout that. But it holds a, a lot of potential, not only the satellites and the rings, but we're going to get really far north because our orbit progresses in the extended mission. It gets twisted around by Jupiter to further and further north. Uh, the perijoves or the close-up approaches will be further and further north, and that's what's going to allow us to investigate all of these incredible uh, atmospheric phenomena in the north. Um, and, it, and, it, and the same twist of the orbit is what allows us to fly by the satellite. So it's just a, a great advantage to have something like that. Um, and so the health is health and safety, or I should say the health of the spacecraft and all the instruments is, uh, is still great. Um, and so I'm really happy to report on that. Um, now, citizen science is, is really something close to my heart. So I really appreciate your question. Um, we spent quite a bit of effort to try to make sure that we could connect to the public and allow them to share the excitement of exploration and discovery. And so um, there's a website, uh, missionjuno.swri.com. Um, and I think that uh, you'll probably be able to get that out of the press release uh, or they'll post it here somewhere. Um, but 
Anybody can go to that website. It's the official Juno website that's uh, at my home institution, Southwest Research Institute. Um, the NASA website has links to it, I believe, as well. And inside that website is a place called JunoCam, or image processing. And the images are loaded up as raw data there. Um, and then there's some tutorials that teach people how to take that image and turn it into an image of Jupiter or whatever it is that you want to do. A lot of the people are, are doing artistic things. Some are doing scientific things. Some of them are so scientifically important. They're making the discoveries for us. We've included them on our, our science papers. They're, they've become science team members almost. Um, but others are expressing themselves artistically, which is a joy to see. Um, or their imagination. I've seen pictures with astronauts uh, sitting at Jupiter. I mean, it's something I want to do. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a great uh, program. And what happens is, is they can process that data. And if they have questions, they can pose them and learn how to do it. We have experts that will help them. And then what, what product they make, the images they make, they can post also. Um, or they can take somebody else's image that has been made and modify it. So there's quite a bit of different levels of uh, complexity that you can jump into depending on how much time you want to spend on it. And, um, and mo almost all the imagery that you see from coming out of Juno, uh, these beautiful images, the animations and videos that we make are all coming from these uh, citizen scientists. So thanks for your question. Thank you. And then up next on the call line, we have a follow-up from Elizabeth Howell from space.com. Hi, this might be for Scott. Thanks again. Um, is Juno able to see any atmospheric changes from the recent asteroid strikes, last couple of asteroid strikes? So we, we looked at that and um, it's still uh, being worked. Um, I almost, it was almost far enough along that I was going to include it in this. Um, but I'm a little hesitant to say too much because it's the, the studies are not done yet, but we did take a close up look and we don't see a, a big mark from that. Um, but I, I say it uh, with, um, with hopefully you'll grant me the right to retract my words <laughs> if, we, if somebody sees something and say, uh, we've got it. As soon as we have a definitive result, we'll, we'll certainly make that available to everybody and, and announce it. But at the, and at the moment, it doesn't look like there's a big signal that jumps out at us. Great. And then up next on the lines is Hagen Warren from NASA Space Flight. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is for Dr. Bolton. How specifically does the atmosphere underneath Jupiter's cloud layer power the cyclones we see on Jupiter? And how specifically do these intense cyclones form? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I know all of the answer to that. We, you know, this is something that we're just studying. How exactly does the the the, the cyclones and anticyclones get powered? And so, you know, on Earth, the meteorology and the weather is very much connected to the water condensation, the water clouds, the sunlight coming down and warming the atmosphere. And it was expected that maybe Jupiter probably worked the same way, and no doubt those processes are important at Jupiter. But the fact that we see the, the roots going deeper than those, much deeper, not just a little bit deeper, but you know, tens of miles, 100 miles beyond the, where the water is, um, tells us that there's another process going on. And we saw another hint of that early in the mission. We saw variability. Of, of ammonia and, and water um, probably going on much deeper than we expected. And, and the answer to that was part of what Lee discussed where, you know, there's lightning going on all over the place. And there was a hypothesis that we put forth that, that there was something called mush balls that might be going up and down transporting this ammonia and water. Now, um, that's like a mush ball is sort of like a Jupiter version of hail. We call it mush because it's a mixture of ammonia and water. It's kind of slushy, and then it has some sort of ice crust around it. And just like hail on the Earth, uh, these things, you know, can get down and still be kind of intact, even though it's too warm for them to for ice to exist. So on the Earth, you see hail land on your driveway. I live in Texas, so we see it 
pretty common. You got to hurry up and hide your car when they're when the hail's coming. Um, but it, it can come down and bounce onto your driveway or street or land on your, your lawn. And there's a chunk of ice, even though it's warmer um, than freezing out. And, and so the hail on Jupiter, which we might call mush balls, um, may transport things down and evaporate. Jupiter gets warmer as you go down. Um, and so once you pass the layer where it's too warm for water to condense or ammonia ice to form, we expect that it should be all vapor. And, and the naive thought was, well, it'll all be mixed up, but it wasn't. Um, so there should, could be energy things going in from underneath, um, but you probably also have something going on from the top that's maybe driving things down. I think that the data is so new um, that, we're, that, that modelers and theoreticians now have to go work this out, and undoubtedly there may be more than one uh, idea out there. Um, I don't know, maybe, Lee, you have another uh, something you might, might want to add to that? So, yeah, you, you asked a really good question about the formation of these cyclones and how they, how they last and how they're maintained over time. And um, I think the thing, we can bring that back again to our uh, Earth-based experience. And you're familiar with the jet stream that whizzes around the northern hemisphere here on Earth and develops these extremely strong meanders that can pull regions of high and low pressure either side of the jet stream and form uh, depressions that then shape the weather system, certainly that we have here in the United Kingdom. So imagine that those jet streams on Jupiter only have to develop a very, very small wiggle or meander, and you can start to spin up a, a cyclonic depression on one side of those jet streams. Once they're started, it's actually quite hard to slow them down. It's quite hard to get rid of them because they don't, you don't have a surface on Jupiter that's dissipating that energy and getting rid of that energy. So they can just persist for a period of time until they get they interact with other storms and with the jet streams to potentially dissipate later on. So they start small, then they can spin up, and then they can last for a long period of time. But the crucial thing is that we then see them because of their effects on the environment. So they change the cloud conditions within them. They change the susceptibility of the atmosphere to these uh, convective plumes, these thunderstorms that can erupt from the deeper layers. So cyclones, when they're there, start to create meteorology that we can then detect with something like Juno or even with a ground-based telescope looking at the incredible dark colours within those cyclones. So really good questions. And I think you can see from my answer that we don't have a complete handle on it just yet. Great. Thank you for your responses. We also have a Follow-up question from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. And, and Scott, the, the other question I was trying to ask was, uh, for anybody on the panel, have you learned anything from studying the polar vortexes of Jupiter that shed any light at all into what might be going on at Saturn? Or are these so dissimilar that there's, there's just nothing much in common? Thanks. Now, now I remember the question. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, in fact, um, you know, I'm going to turn to uh, Alessandro in a moment because he he was reporting on a on a another manuscript that that um, that actually looked at that and tried to say, you know, how do I compare uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and why does Jupiter have these polar cyclones and Saturn doesn't? Um, so. Uh, and the answer had to do with the forces and just the way things were. But Alessandro, maybe you want to echo or, or mm -hmm. expand on what you presented. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So in fact, there is uh, this new manuscript by colleagues of Karen that has been published recently, and it explained nicely the reason why we have do we do have uh, those kind of uh, structures at, at Jupiter we don't at, at Saturn. So think for for example at the Earth, change the rotation speed of the Earth, you get a different meteorology. If you change the gravity of the Earth, you get a different meteorology. If you change the, the amount of energy the Earth gets from the Sun, still you have a different meteorology. So every planet has its own uh, uh, key quantities, and these key, key quantities, of course, they impact on the meteorology. So the meteor meteorology of Jupiter is so peculiar because Jupiter has the right size and the right width spin and the right energy to get the size of the cyclones. They are big enough to, to maintain this kind of mutual uh, rejection forces, but they're not, they not so large uh, to get just one cycle. Out there. So actually, Jupiter is the perfect case to match uh, the 
very simple theory that is at the base of the formation of theory of, uh, of cyclones. And that's the reason why we do have at Jupiter. And so probably we will have this kind of structure, even at every kind of exoplanet I'm dreaming of, uh, that are the same size of Jupiter and get the same, the same energy. Exocyclones. Thank you. And up next on the call line is Morgan McFall Johnson with Insider. Hi, thank you. I think this question is for Scott or Marzia. I wanted to ask about the jet streams going so much deeper than the great red spot. Was that surprising? Does it make sense for the jet streams to be so deep in the spot to be such a pancake in comparison? And do you have an understanding of why it's structured like that? Thank you. Um, well, I can just tell you a little bit, but I think uh, Marzia might be able to say a bit more because it is through the gravity analysis, and it was a colleague of hers and Karen's that that published that paper, Yohai Kaspi. Um, now, you know, when we look at the jet streams going down, and we can and and we look at the gravity field, we see a signature. The jet streams and the zonal winds on Jupiter have an asymmetry north to south. In fact, the asymmetry on Jupiter is almost a theme of this planet, and some of it wasn't really expected. Um, the magnetic field is asymmetric, the gravity field is asymmetric, and the atmosphere is asymmetric, and yet it's a giant ball of gas spinning around in 10 hours. And so, so a little bit of it is surprising that that is able to be so asymmetric. But when you look at this in, and you see these jet streams going down and they're detected, this asymmetry was detected in the gravity field at a depth of about 2,000 miles. Um, and then below that, we think maybe it was rotating around as a solid body, right? So above that, it's spinning around like on cylinders almost where you're represented by the jet streams. Now, when you look at, at that, a little bit and you say, okay, well, if there's a jet stream moving a lot of uh, wind, a lot of the atmosphere um, down that deep, at some point when it gets deep enough, uh, the magnetic field is going to be sensed. The magnetic field is starting to get stronger and stronger, and there'll be a layer down there where the atmosphere becomes more and more ionized and charged, so to speak. And when, when that happens, it's almost like putting the brakes on the wind streams or the jet streams because now they don't just move around neutral atmosphere. If they're gonna keep moving, they've gotta, they've gotta fight with the magnetic field, which is a, a force to be reckoned with. Um, and so that's part of why you might see those decay. Um, now, what stops the, um, the great red spot from going down that deep uh, may also be, you know, the layers get higher and higher pressure, higher and higher temperature, and eventually whatever's causing these may may lose its uh, its ability to stay as a uh, as an intact system. Um, but it's not clear exactly how that works. And you know, somebody uh, an earlier question was talking about, you know, how do you form these things? How do you form the the vortex storms in the first place? And so there are people that are looking at whether you know eddies coming up from beneath could actually play a role. And uh, we don't necessarily have data that favors one idea versus the other, but that is a possibility. And, and, um, and so it could go, they, you know, the great red spot, even though the most of the mass uh, maybe doesn't go much below 500 kilometers, um, there could still be things going on much deeper. Um, Marcia, do you, do you have uh, any more on the depth of the zones and belts? that you want to add? Uh, yes, Scott, I just a uh, brief comment. So she mentioned uh, if this was surprising for us, and I would say um, in a way, yes, and in a way, no, in the sense that I think most uh, of the scientific community, they were thinking that the Great Race Ball was very shallow. Um, there were two schools of thoughts, of course, um, between people that thought, you know, it was going to stop in really in the first uh, layers of the atmosphere and others that thought that maybe it will even go uh, all the way down to, to the center of the planet. So I, I don't think that was, it was surprising actually to see it go so deep. And as Scott said, there are different um, uh, things that contribute to the dampening of the flows. There are um, reasons that are related to the magnetic field and the uniform rotation uh, at depth. 
And obviously there is something at 500 kilometers that is limiting the, the circulation uh, of the great red spot. So I would say, uh, because we have these new measurements, then at this point, uh, it's more kind of like reverse engineering. So we know how deep the jet streams are and how deep the great red spot is. So can theoreticians explain why uh, th this is, uh, there, there is such a difference in the depth of, uh, of the jet streams and the great red spot? which of course are different. Also, the mechanism um, that govern them are similar but different. Thank you. And we also have some questions coming in from social media with the Juno mission hashtag. Kate on YouTube asks, would the colors in Jupiter change with different temperatures? I think I'm going to let Lee answer that because I know he's got a good answer. <laughs> that is an absolutely fabulous uh, question. And, um, you know, to this day, it's one of the uh, embarrassments maybe of planetary science that we still don't know exactly what is causing the colors of Jupiter. Those beautiful reds and browns that we see in the cloud decks could be being created by compounds that contain things like sulfur, things like phosphorus in the cloud tops of Jupiter. Um, but we don't know exactly what that, that signature fingerprint of that material might be like. So yes, if you start to change the temperature of the atmosphere, if you warmed it up a lot or if you cooled it down a lot, you would certainly be changing the composition, the blend of different species that are present within the cloud tops that are then absorbing and reflecting different amounts of light. I mean, I'll give you a, a good example. Say we started bringing Jupiter closer and closer in towards the sun. This would be bad news for us as human race, by the way. But if we did it, you would start to evaporate off those ammonia clouds. They would come back to become a vapor. And you'd start to excavate clouds from deeper and deeper down to the extent that those water clouds that we keep talking about would suddenly become visible. And a Jupiter that is covered in water clouds would appear maybe the same sort of whitish gray that you sometimes see when you look at the globe of the Earth when it's covered in clouds as well. So certainly the colors will change with temperature. And the reason is because the atmospheric composition will change as you turn that temperature dial uh, up and down. So that's a fabulous question. I hope I've answered it for you. Yeah, let, let me just add one thing to that, which is uh, along this exact same line that you were saying is, is that, in fact, that's what we see, right? We, when we look at Jupiter and we see these beautiful swirls of different colors, we're seeing in, in many ways, one of the things I described in one of the later images was you're seeing different cloud layers. And, and so those different cloud layers are different colors because of the composition changes, presumably. And that's changing because as I go down into Jupiter, the temperature and pressure are increasing. And so that changes what condenses where, um, what can exist, what the mixtures are, how it gets mixed up. So, so Lee's right, you know, if you, if you moved it in, and I'm not a big fan of that because we'd have to leave, um, uh, and it, uh, but you could, if you just turned up the heat. Now, also keep in mind that Jupiter receives uh, energy and heat from the sun, but it's actually warmer in the middle because it's still cooling off from its formation. So it's, 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 it's radiating out heat more than it's bringing it in. I didn't think of Jupiter as any other color than what we know it as today. We also have a caller on the line now, Leo Enright with Irish TV. Thanks, Raquel. This is kind of a related question uh, to Scott Bolton uh, to do with the citizen science image, the, uh, the, the uh, swift picture of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, could you help us to interpret what we're seeing? I mean, if I saw this, as a picture of the Earth or of Mars, I would say, okay, I know that's high, that's low, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, can you say what we're seeing here in terms of depth, or, or is, is that uh, not possible? Um, well, I can to some degree, uh, not completely, but I mean, actually, if you look very close at that image and you blow it up on your screen, 
because um, it's pretty high resolution, you can actually see some of the shadows that we're, that we're analyzing. And, though, and when something casts a shadow, um, you'll be able to tell that it's what its height is relative to the cloud base that's below it. And in, I don't know exactly which image you were talking about, but, but one of them at the end that I showed, showed multiple layers and, and sort of illustrated that example uh, very well. And so um, part of the, our ability to look at that and determine the height of these things has to do with the shadows that we're analyzing. And we're just starting to actually you know, develop models that can go in and really look closely at those shadows to try to put constraints on them. Um, because, you know, before Juno came along, we didn't see a lot of that. You didn't have these incredible close-ups that could tell you all of that. You had a little bit of it, but we're getting a lot of it. And so we're developing models now, and I'm sure, and there are probably scientists that are outside our team that are also playing that same game, because that's going to be very important to understanding the atmospheric dynamics. And sometimes, you know, the clouds part, uh, and even with a visible image, you get to see down deep. And and back in 1995, Galileo probe went in and measured Jupiter, trying to understand how its composition worked and what the st structure was like and how temperature and pressure changed as you went in. And um, and some of the results were very puzzling to us. And, and one of the results that came out was, well, it went into this place that we call the hot spot, warmer than everything else. Maybe there was a big downdraft and some infrared images sort of supported that idea. I think today we look at it and we think, well, you know, there was a, th those hot spots are in some sense a break in the clouds and you get to see in to the lower layers and the lower layers are warmer. Um, but there may also be downdrafts. Why is there a break in the clouds? So, um, I don't know if that's shedding the light that you were hoping uh, for me to explain it. It's Jupiter's atmosphere is incredibly dynamic. It's it's not. Um, I'm not describing a geologic landscape a little bit like Mars, where I can say here's a crater, here's a dune. Um, it's atmospheric dynamics of things blowing around, but there are different layers, and you can see those in the shadows. Great, thank you for that answer, Scott. Now. That is all the time we have for questions today. Please contact the media line at 818-354-5011 for any additional or follow-up questions that you may have. And I'd like to thank the panel and all the people that called in to submit their questions. For more information on the mission, visit nasa.gov slash Juno and missionjuno.sri. Edu. You can also follow along on social media at NASA Solar System. Thanks again for joining us today.
liftoff of Progress 79, the next vehicle in the supply chain to the International Space Station.